By 1969, the muscle car wars were in full swing. Ford was putting the Super into Cobra jets. Pontiac was ramming air down the throats of their motors. Mopar would multi-carve just about anything. And Chevrolet was shoehorning big blocks into everything. Even lowly AMC was getting in on the action. What the Baldwin Motion Team, Royal Pontiac, The Hearst Corporation, Yanko Chevrolet, Grand Spalding Dodge, and Shelby produced in 1969 would never be repeated. These are the supercars from 1969. on both coasts, Legendary Motor Car has assembled some of the world's rarest muscle cars. Normally these cars are polished and pampered, but not today. Well, hi there, welcome to another Dream Car Garage muscle car shoot up. Now, you know the format. We're going to use the four classic tests, zero to 60, 60 to zero. We're gonna do a quarter mile test, and we're also going to send all of these cars through a slalom. We're going to use a device called TrackMate. Glenn Stevens from TrackMate is here. He'll take care of all of the timing to keep it simple and fair. But the real story here is the cars. How about the burnout contest? We'll talk about the burnout contest later. You're right, the real story it's is the tradition. cars. <laughs> We've got an AMC, a Rambler Scrambler, prepared by Hearst. We've got a Super B 446 pack prepared by Mr. Norm. We've got a Baldwin Motion 427 Camaro. We've got a 69 Shelby GT500 Super Cobra Jet Drag Pack car. We've got a Royal Pontiac Ram Air 4 GTO. And we've got a Yanko Nova. Rare, rare car. This year, all the cars are four speeds. All right? Yep. All the cars have posies in them. All the cars have either 391, 410, or 411 rear ends in it. That's as close as we could get them. We tried to make it as, easy, as even as possible. We even took them back to the shop. Truth was, all that was coincidence. But Legendary Motor Car did go through the cars, made sure they had a tune-up, set the timing up, did a nut and bolt, and road tested all of them. And Koki Coker provided us with all rubber that's all the same. So it's just about it's as easy as it could. Good thing we did that, too, because one of the cars we had to find a substitute for, we actually had on a road test a motor go south. But it's better there than it is here. True enough, but it would have been entertaining to see you blow a motor, spin in your own oil, and wipe out a half million dollar car. For, oh, that's for a change. Yeah, that's a lot of fun. I wonder, if the guy we, for I wonder if the guy we borrowed the car from would think that's funny. Well, you'd use your pricing and you'd get top dollar. <laughs> All that and a whole lot more with a brand new muscle car shootout on Dream Car Garage. This portion of the Super Muscle Car Shootout is brought to you by Year One your restoration and performance headquarters. The gold standard of all tests is the zero to 60 test. Now, it seems kind of simple. For bench racers, you basically take the lowest number and then all cars do that. But it's not always easy to repeat that number. So over the last three years, Peter's been doing this test again and again. You'd think you'd learn a little something, wouldn't you? you learn anything? From you, I learned something every day. What yeah, not to I'm do I'm talking in life. about zero to 60 now. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> we did, actually. And what we found is, unlike slicks, where if you reduce the tire pressures, you usually get a little bit better bite, with these bias ply tires, it seems that if you increase the tire pressure, you get a little bit more bite. The way to check it is to do a little bit of a burnout. If the outside of the, of the burnout pattern is really dark, that means that you're underinflated. If the middle of the burnout pattern is really dark, that means you're overinflated. What we found is roughly 40 pounds is the right amount. So try it in your driveway. I'm certain your wife wouldn't mind, would you? If did yeah. a little burnout in the driveway? <laughs> your wife never minds. No, she never minds. Try it in the driveway, about 40 pounds. Next time you're at the drag strip, I'm certain you're gonna go a little faster. About an hour from the CN Tower is Toronto Motorsports Park, an NHRA sanctioned drag strip that's 50 years old. It's the site of our zero to 60 and our quarter mile tests.
interesting with this car is that it's a brand new restoration, a real nice restoration. I'm not sure if it's been totally debugged. I'm having a few little problems. One, the shifter isn't quite 100%, and secondly, the car gets a lot of wheel hop. So we tried the first time doing a big burnout, and we got way too much wheel hop. It just got too much bite in, in, the, uh, in the rubber. The second time we tried coming out a little bit easier and it hooked better. So I think the second or third run will be best. All in all, hooks real well, but has a real wheel hop problem, this car. When a driver runs out of talent at the drag strip, he normally blames it on wheel hop. Let's see how Peter does with this Shelby. I think that the fact that the horsepower to weight ratio on this car isn't that great, it's a fairly heavy car, it's not making a whole bunch of horsepower, helps with the launch. So in the zero to 60 time, it's a heavy car, it's got a, the biggest tire of the bunch here. It's not hard to come off the line, you don't just instantly spin the tires. Zero to 60 might not be too bad, but I think it's gonna pay the price in the quarter mile. Keep in mind that we're not giving Peter the times as he lays them down. Everything he's telling you is from the seat of his pants. I'm impressed with this little car. I think the zero to 60 times are gonna be great. I think it might be a sleeper in the quarter mile. The, the thing that makes this thing so easy to drive, it doesn't have huge amounts of horsepower torque that just overwhelm the rear tires. It's pretty easy to get launched and hooked up. It's gonna be an impressive little car. If we wanna talk about the epitome of the tuned car, I guess you could say from the muscle car era, you have to talk about uh, Baldwin Motion Camaros. You get phase one, two, and three cars, for example. Phase one would be uh, a basic dyno tune on a big block Camaro. Phase two would have a few more pieces. Phase three is going to be, you know, an over-the-top drag car that you could license and put on the street. Uh, so if you look at the range of offerings uh, from all of the tuners, Baldwin Motion has to be uh, top level, I guess you could say. The Baldwin Motion car, that's going to be another stout runner uh, if it's set up right. Baldwin Motion, uh, Motion Performance, Joel Rosen, he was a race shop and he was around the corner from the dealership and he worked in collaboration with uh, Baldwin Chevrolet. And uh, when he was building his Camaros, he was, uh, the, the phase three cars, he guaranteed an 1150 at 120 mile per hour, quarter mile time, utilizing a NHRA approved driver out of all the cars that, uh, that left his shop. And that was a hell of a guarantee and he never had a return on that guarantee. What you did is you went into the Baldwin Chevrolet dealership, you told them that you want a, a hot rod Camaro or a Pala or whatever you wanted. They would take the car, send it over to Motion Performance. Then you'd go over and meet with Joel. He'd ask you, how fast did you want to go? If you told him you wanted to run 11, he said, not a problem. He'd take that L78, the 396 out of your Camaro, put in a 427. In this particular case, he had a 950 Holly on it. He had a set of headers. Totally reworked the innards of this car. It was a phase three car. He had the ignition system, his motion phase three ignition system, set of track bars. Put in a her shifter, 411 posi out back, then added all the wild graphics. He had a lightweight fiberglass hood incorporating the 67 Corvette Stinger. He, now, what's interesting about this car as well, it's an RS. This is a rare combination. A lot of guys that wanted to go fast didn't want all the extras. Still has basically stock suspension as far as the disc brakes in the front, the drums out back. As far as the uh, sway bars and that, it's got all the heavy duty springs that would have come standard with an L78 Camaro. All in all, this is probably going to be the most potent package in a straight line. One was definitely the best one, uh, had maybe five foot of wheel spin. Second one I tried with no wheel spin at all and it just fell flat on its face. Third one I just sucked, I spun it all the way up the track. First one's gonna be the winner on that one. He's finally admitted it. I think all in all, for a big, heavy car, it hooks up real well out of the hole. Let's see what it's like with the quarter mile. <laughs> By 
by far the easiest car to hook up out of the hole. And again, I think, I mean, the whole thing with these tires is if you can get the car hooked up, the quarter mile time is going to be great. I think the zero to 60 time is going to be awesome in this car. And it was problems with getting the Yanko Nova to hook up, which cost it so dearly in this test. Look at the range between all the cars. There's seven tenths of a second there, and that's an eternity in a zero to 60 test. So when we look at the points the first time, the Yanko Nova's got a lot to make up. But Peter's instinct on the Pontiac GTO and the Dodge Super B were right on. When we come back, we'll go 60 to zero. Well, we've gotten to the part of the day where we're going to do a 60 to zero braking test. And again, we're going to employ TrackMate to do that. So even a guy with a tiny little acumen and a very little bit of ability could pull this off. Now, the whole idea behind these cars is they're all a little bit different. We've got combinations of discs and drums. We've got different combinations on every car and a different weight in each car. So Peter's actually going to have to drive the actual car and be a hot dog about it, too. I can't believe I missed you two years in a row. Yeah. Here, have, have <laughs> a Must mint. be the wind. <laughs> Your breath stinks. <laughs> That's not my breath, buddy. <laughs> Shake a leg. <laughs> Let's see if he gets away with this. <laughs> you know, I'm kind of impressed with this car. I didn't think it would stop this well. It's, it appears to be a big, heavy car, but I don't think it's as heavy as it looks. And nothing dramatic. The car stops pretty good. You have to steer it a little bit, but it certainly doesn't pitch you sideways. Nice, drivable car. Now, you've got to admit, it's a lot more fun not to tell Peter the data as we collect it. Well, the first time I hit the brakes, it got my attention, but I'm certain it got the cameraman's attention even more because I see him jumping out of the way. I, I guess what happened is, is the adjusters hadn't really set themselves yet, and it just wanted to swap ends. So a couple times I had to let off the brake just so it wouldn't come around on me. The next two times it got a lot better, and it actually settled into stopping nice and straight. Light car, uh, short wheelbase, uh, brakes work real well on the car once they're set up. seems like the vacuum booster isn't working real well or we're just not making enough vacuum and I'm not sure if it's hurting me or helping me. Obviously, I'm giving all the pedal pressure I can give, but it, the car really isn't wandering around at all and maybe that's helping me a little bit in this case. I don't have to drive the car. I don't have to worry about the car getting pitched sideways. This is a wonderful event, this muscle car shootout. You know, what could be better than having the top muscle cars of the era be out here dueling it out against each other, leveling the playing field? I think this is just absolutely wonderful. And, you know, I was asked, who do I think is going to win the event? Man, the one on my tires, hopefully. But, you know, I, I, get, I got to tell you that I'm a GTO fan. So, you know, go, go. The Royal Pontiac really was kind of a factory front. I know, uh, for example, in the GTO world, uh, Jim Wangers and some of the marketing guys that were, that were heavy into pushing the GTO to try to get it established, um, would actually uh, go to, to Wilson's dealership, uh, Royal Pontiac, and, and uh, play around with some of the cars. I mean, one of the classic examples, of course, is the car and driver uh, road test from back in 64. Uh, Royal was known for, for all sorts of things. They, didn't, they really didn't drill down to a, to a set package uh, that they marketed and sold as a unit. Uh, they were, they were uh, noted for tuning. They were also noted for pulling out uh, 389s and dropping in 421s and making it look like nobody had ever been in there and, and done anything. This car is a Ram Air 4 making 370 horsepower. Now everybody thinks that the Ram Air 3 and 4, there's only four horsepower difference. How big a deal could it be? It was huge. They actually lied about the 370 horsepower. They had the round port heads, made a lot more power, aluminum intake, they had steel crank and rods, 10.75 to 1 compression. The motor worked real strong. Behind that, this car got an M21. Nice transmission, close ratio. It's gonna be real stout, zero to 60 in a quarter mile. Now the guy behind all that was a fella named Milt Shornak. The two packages that we uh, uh, programmed into our setup was uh, a light duty package which uh, 
consisted of doing carburetors, distributors, and uh, adjustable lock nuts. And the second package, which was a more defined piece, involved removing the cylinder heads and uh, having them milled and putting a thinner head gasket and blocking the heat risers. The Bobcat stickers that you received with the packages were put on the car by us normally, rather whether you had the minor or the major, but it depended upon the year of the automobile. Car actually stops real nice, nice and straight, no drama at all. Brakes work excellent in this car. We'll just see if it, uh, if it holds up. Well, this definitely was an exciting one to get woed down. I think the problem here is we got this great big motor up front, light little car, which as soon as you hit the brakes, the nose comes down hard, the back end goes up. It's got the drums out back. If they're not perfectly adjusted, it just wants to throw the car sideways. Peter's road racing instincts make him think that the best way to stop a car like that is to throw it sideways. You gotta really drive this car. It's doable, but I don't know if it's gonna be the fastest. It's interesting, both of the Chevys reacted exactly the same way under hard braking. When you see all six cars tested back to back and watch what Peter has to do to get the most performance out of them, it's got to occur to you that the number really doesn't mean as much as the way the car behaves when you're trying to get it woed down. Look at the range between all of these cars. Once again, the Yanko Nova is really the longest stopping distance, but also had the most drama, basically sideways. And who would have thought that the GT500 would take all six points? When we come back, we'll send all six cars through the slalom course. All right, what do you want me to do here? Well, you've done this about five or six times before in all the other shootouts, but the cool thing is, this time we're gonna use track mate. So we'll be able to get your entry speed, your exit speed, your average speed, uh, your top speed, your average G, your top G. Time. One of those things. Are we gonna measure time? <laughs> we can measure all that time. and we're gonna measure time. <laughs> we can measure time too. <laughs> but one of those things, you're gonna be consistent enough, we'll be able to make you look good. Uh, is this your idea of a joke? <laughs> it's just a little Very funny, very funny. Just a little funny. reminder, you're always calling me a pylon. <laughs> now you get to be one. Second of all, don't beat yourself up. What does that mean? I'm not going to hit one of those. You always Especially do. myself. <laughs> you always do, and that's expensive hardware. Out there. Not going to happen. It's going to happen. The Dream Car Garage guys asked us a track mate to come apply our GPS technology and accelerometer technology to measure the performance of these cars. We used the GPS for the zero to 60 and for the braking tests, braking distance. And then for the slalom, we were able to measure both G-forces and the amount of time through the slalom. When you think about it after nine years of Dream Car Garage and the fact that Peter drives a muscle car hard in virtually every episode, probably is no better driver to take these cars through a slalom course, which they were definitely not meant to do. This car is a handful to drive it's tight and everything, but I can't believe the steering box has got to be like a 20 to 1 ratio. I'm just sawing at it one way and the other way. So the last time I tried actually just coming as close to the pylons and trying not to get too radical, I don't think this is going to be a real fast car through the slalom, but we'll see. Cone number one goes down as Peter has a real workout getting this Shelby to change directions. For a big, heavy car, I'm kind of impressed how this thing went through the pylons. Again, second gear seems to work a lot better than first. The thing that I didn't like about the car, even though it's got power steering and only two of the cars here have power steering, it's a little bit sloppy, which was a traditional Ford trait in, in 69. But it sure helps when you're going through there, you can almost one hand it as opposed to having to use two hands. Be interesting to see what the times are like. AMC was, was, was scrambling to uh, come up with a, a, 
performance car that, that, that fit a more uh, practical niche. The, all they had was really at the time in 1969 was the AMX, and you've got to remember that that was a two-seater. The AMC that we have here is, is a little bit different. It's not a dealer-modified car. It was actually uh, modified by the Hearst Corporation. Uh, everybody that's a gearhead's heard of Hearst, you know, of shifter fame. Uh, Hearst was, uh, would receive the cars, and they were the ones who applied the uh, paint schemes and the scoops and, uh, and uh, funny upholstery and everything that, that makes the, uh, the Scrambler such an eccentric car. Uh, the example we have here is a 394-speed car. It's a small, light package, so I think it'll actually perform pretty well. Uh, it's up against some pretty serious competition, so I don't know if it's going to win the whole thing, but I think most people will be surprised at how well the, the Hearst Prep AMC runs. It started out like a little plain Jane Rambler, but they dumped a 390 in it. Of course, they had a four-speed in it. All Hearst Scramblers come with a four-speed and a 356 Posi rear end, and of course, the Hearst Shifter. Well, as far as performance went, the little 390 makes about 315 horsepower, so it gets up and goes pretty good. But where it's going to really shine is in the torque department. This car makes 425 foot-pounds of torque. If I can get the power to those little red lines out back, this thing might shock some people in 0 to 60, even though it's up against some tough competition. The car really was an econo box in the sense that it was under $3,000, and it was actually a fairly light package. It weighed only about 3,000 pounds. And that, coupled with some disc brakes up front, might shock some people in the braking department, and I think it's going to get around the slalom pretty well. A couple of the cool little accessories is a sun tack, and if you were really excited about going fast, you could order a 2-4 setup which brought horsepower up to almost 400 horsepower. These cars were really designed for the F-Stock class, and they performed exceptionally well. With a little bit of tweaking, these cars surprised a lot of big, big muscle cars back in the 60s. An interesting side note here, Milt Chornak, that was famous from Royal Pontiac days, also had a fair bit of influence on the head work on these cars. He did the first 75 sets of heads and actually got the motors to the point where they would run with a lot of the other big blocks. They needed a little bit more power, so they wanted someone to go through and do cylinder head work for them, and, and they would uh, remove cylinder heads and bring them to me, where I would do a performance valve job and have the heads milled approximately 30 thousandths, clean them, set the spring heights, and then ship them back to them. History here. This could be the first time one of these cars has ever been tested through a bunch of pylons. Well, I'll tell you what, this is a fun little car. I can't believe how well this car handles. Every one of these AMCs I've driven before just didn't work very well. Whoever rebuilt this car did a great job in the front end. The first time I went through in first gear, it was just too much on and off the throttle. It would just spin the car a little too much. The second and third time, I tried it in second gear, and it works really nice in second gear. All in all, I'm impressed with this little car. You know, it's got a little E70 uh, uh, tire on the car. Impressive. So far, the Shelby's the car to beat, as far as the pylons are concerned, and believe me, nobody expected that. Coming up, one of the rarest Novas on the planet. This portion of the Muscle Car Shootout is brought to you by Intercity Lines Incorporated, America's premier enclosed auto transport company. Yinko is extremely well known for Camaros, of course. Most people think of 69 Camaros when you think of uh, a Yinko Chevrolet. Um, one of the more rare cars and one of the more potent packages, of course, uh, were the Yinko Novas. Now, anybody that's spent any time around a drag strip knows that it's hard to outrun a big block Nova. And a few reasons for that. It's got more rear overhang. It's lighter than a Camaro, typically. Uh, so when Yinko worked his magic on the 69 Nova, I ended up with a, with a very strong piece and a piece that's certainly hard to outrun. The, the, the Yinko Nova is the most dangerous car <laughs> in this shootout. Dangerous in that it could win. Uh, just, just off of power to weight ratio, and that car is 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 a weapon. It's 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 the lightest, the lightest platform that Chevy had with the with the with the meanest motor that they could drop into it. Now, of course, like everything else Yanko did, unlike somebody like uh, Joel Rosen for motion performance, is he created packages, and that's. He added the striping, he added the, the decals to the headrest, he added the wheels, he added the sun tack. 
He sold a package, and that's what he did with the Camaros as well as the Novas and then the Deuces the next year. It was because of these packages that made Don Yanko probably the most famous and recognized of all the supercar dealers. He took an L78 Nova, pulled out the motor, put in the 427. Well, the 427 was a stout motor, 11 to 1 compression, steel crank and rods, great set of heads, aluminum intake, a 780 Holly on top, lots of performance. Behind that, he put an M21 transmission. Behind that, he put a 411 Posi. All of that in this little lightweight sleeper of a package, the Nova. Car probably only weighs just over 3,000 pounds. At this point, Peter doesn't know it, but virtually everybody at the track is cheering for the Nova. Surely, it'll do better in this test. If nothing else, it's always fun to take one of these little cars through the, the, through the pylons or the slalom. What's interesting is four of these cars have no power steering. And it's not that it's that bad. What happens is you just have to almost let go of the wheel, catch it, because you can't steer it back fast enough. And the one time I missed it and I hit the pylon, but I think that's still the fastest run in the bunch. Pylon number two. This has got to be the closest steering box I've ever driven in a Camaro. I don't know what Joel Rosen did, but it works in this car. It's almost too, too uh, close to race. It's got to be a 12 to 1 box or something in this. Maybe got it out of a Corvette or who knows what, but I'll tell you, it's impressive on turn-in. It's got so much power when you get on the gas as well that it just wants to slide the back end around. First time, I just, I was blown away how quick it turned in. The second time, I got used to it, kind of a little smoother. Third time, I tried powering through as well. Second or third time is going to be the fastest, but I'm impressed. Maybe it's just I'm coming from one car that, you know, doesn't have a, a close ratio box, and this car does, but I'm impressed how this car turns in. Pylon number three. Let's face it, none of these cars were really designed to go through a slalom course. I was actually pleasantly surprised how the car worked. I expect it to be worse, but I still think it's going to be the slowest. And a lot of guys will argue with me, but that torsion bar suspension just doesn't work as well, probably because it's never really been developed. You know, some of the other cars were in, in the Trans Am series and that, so they had more developed front ends in the car. It worked better than I thought it would, but I don't think it's going to be good enough to really get up high on the points here. Surprise, Pete. The Dodge Super B is actually not so bad, and it's the poor Nova that actually takes the brunt of this one. At 35.98 miles an hour, the Camaro is very good, but it's not that much better than the Shelby and the GTO. So it's tightening up for these three cars. When we come back, we'll run them down 1,320 feet. I can't believe if it isn't 100 degree temperatures, it's gonna be 100 mile an hour winds straight ahead of us. We're driving into this. Every Cub Scout knows that a straight out flag means gale force wind, so we're probably not gonna set any records here. But as long as the wind blows all day, you'll be all right for- You were in Cub Scouts? Yeah, I was in Cub Scouts. What, what were you into? <laughs> beavers? Well, you start, <laughs> up here, you start actually in beavers, and then you go to Cub Scouts. Yeah, yeah. The beaver uniform was just not for me. But I, I don't think make, any uniform that size would I be for you. I made the Cub Scout uniform look good. <laughs> and then <laughs> turned into this. <laughs> so anyway, we've got the track mate going. We're not going to rely on the system here at Toronto Motorsports Park. Glenn Stevens is not only going to be able to give us an ET mile an hour, but we'll also look at three quarter track, half track, and a whole bunch of data so that we can see how these cars perform, not just out of the hole and at the end, but all the way through. The other thing too that we learned from doing this over the last couple of years is with these cars, forget dropping the clutch at 3,000 RPM or even 2,000 RPM, the tires won't hook up. The guys from Fast and the guys from the Pure Stock have taught us now that you almost come off the line on idle and then get after the pedal and make sure it doesn't spin. So the whole idea is to give each of these cars the best shot possible and Unfortunately, we have to rely on him. <laughs> now, you've got to wonder what excuse he's going to come up with this time about why the Nova didn't work out here. Once again, all of us at the track are rooting for this car. Please, Pete, make it do something.
The car feels plenty quick. It's making enough horsepower. The problem here is just getting the car hooked up. It just has incredible amounts of wheel hop. I don't know if this, the springs need to be clamped or if it's a different type of spring, but every single gear, the thing just gives incredible wheel hop. This car could go a lot faster than it's running today. Problem is, is the rear suspension. You know, I gotta thank Kevin giving us a car that's just freshly restored. But the problem is, is the car hasn't been dialed in yet. The rear suspension just can't hook up all the horsepower. When it comes to tuners, I guess you could say, uh, does, it, does it get any more famous than Shelby? Uh, Carroll Shelby really is synonymous with Ford performance. Uh, he, he probably did more for the whole aftermarket tuning world than anyone else, I guess you could say. Um, you know, he would, he would take a, a Mustang, for example, and make it just an outrageous car. Uh, starting in 65, you know, with, with Mustangs really intended to go road racing, uh, then up through the big block cars of, of the later 60s, uh, even to the Cobras. Uh, he, he, was, he was really over and above, it seems like, everybody else, and of course, the, the name Shelby just has that connotation. I mean, it still does. There's a reason that Ford Motor Company still wants to associate their products with Shelby. The Shelby represents the most developed of the factory-involved programs, especially uh, uh, 67 was really the last year that Shelby was building the cars in California. In 1968, production was moved to back to Michigan, uh, not under Ford's roof, but, but under much more direct Ford control. Um, and the cars got heavier and more content-filled. But the cars weren't exactly light. How will it, how will it fare against the other cars? It's, it's not going to be the lightest of the group. It can hold its own with horsepower, but I think it's toting around a little bit more weight than the other cars. Secondly, I know from experience, because I've got a 68 500 KR, that big block Shelby Mustangs are nose heavy through the cones. I'm sure you could say all the other cars are going to be nose heavy as well. It's just that a Mustang chassis, handling, they don't work out too well. They fixed a lot of those problems when they developed the Boss cars. The GT500 we got here was the first year of the Super Cobra Jet, which gave us the same 335 rated horsepower, but in reality it was closer to 400, 440 foot-pounds of torque. How did we get that? Well, we had a 10.6 to 1 compression motor. We had those great Super Cobra Jet heads. We had good steel crank and rods. We had an oil cooler there that helped keep the whole package cool. Of course, the Super Cobra Jets, the drag packs came with a 391 or a 430. This car here is equipped with the 391 rear end. It's got a top loader in it, a close ratio gearbox, bulletproof gearbox. Now, as far as braking goes, you've got the disc brakes up front, the small drums in the back. But what's really going to hurt this car in, in braking and handling is going to be the fact that it weighs so much. It's 3,800 pounds. Even though it's got fiberglass hood and fiberglass fenders and the deck laid out back, it's got a lot of extra creature comforts in, in the roll bar and the interior is pretty plush. It's not a lightweight car. Well, all that makes sense. Let's kind of see if the parents' opinion of Peter has been proved wrong before. Let's see how this Shelby actually works out. the hole it hooks fine it just doesn't have the same sort of horsepower as the big block Chevys or some of the other cars out there real respectable heavy car not quite enough horsepower hooks fine works good just that's all it's got sorts of horsepower. It hooks up a lot better than the Nova does, but still doesn't hook up quite as good as some of the other cars. It just feels like it can spin the tires. Second gear, if I power shift it, it just lights up the tires again. This car's got all sorts of power. Just need to try and hook it up a little bit better. So far, the Yenko Nova is holding its own. And the Baldwin Motion Camaro is the fastest car of all. When we come back, we'll take a close look at this Super B. NPD takes the frustration out of restoration. Your source for quality products, great prices, huge in-stock inventories, and personal service. This car 
tire is such a surprise. The first time I spun the tires too much, the second time it just hooked out of the hole really nice. This car is a surprisingly fast little car, and I don't think it's because it makes a whole bunch of horsepower or torque. Well, it makes a fair bit of torque, but the thing is it just comes off the line so nice if you get it just right. If you miss, you're gonna spin the tires, but a couple times I got it right, it just hooks up nicely. In the Mopar world, uh, obviously, uh, Mr. Norms is the first name to come to mind. I mean, uh, Norm Krause was a dealership, you know, it was a huge performance dealership. Uh, people just kind of flocked to it from, from all kinds of states around it, even in the Midwest. And uh, Norm Krause was, uh, was another pioneer in, put in, in taking the larger uh, motors and putting them into the smaller cars. Only this time, Dodge was paying attention to what he was doing, and, and a lot of the, uh, the special models that he built and sold on his lot uh, became blueprints for, uh, for what Dodge made as, uh, as uh, regular production models. So, The, the 69 six-pack 440 uh, set up as a, as a heck of a street package. If, if you look at the performance of the car, in most cases they would outrun Hemi cars. Uh, and obviously you could modify a Hemi car to be extremely strong, but you know, out there in the mean streets of Woodward Avenue or something like that, you know, if you ran across a well-prepared 69 440 car, it's pretty hard to outrun. Well, it's 1969 and you want the ultimate Mopar, what are you going to order? Probably a 446 pack Super B, a liftoff hood car. Let's face it, with the liftoff hood, a little less weight, no hood hinges, the four pins. Stock, steel style wheels, 15 inch wheels, no hubcaps even. These cars were stripped right down so they were nice and light or as light as the car could be. Under the hood, they went to the Hemi parts bin for valve springs and retainers. They had an Edelbrock intake where 1375 CFM flowed through three two barrels. They had a reworked camshaft, they had pro molly rings. The car ended up, or the motor ended up making 390 horsepower, but more importantly, it made 490 foot-pounds of torque. It's the torque that's gonna take this car down the track. Well, this car was not about anything other than going fast. You couldn't get air conditioning, you really couldn't get a whole bunch of creature comforts. Matter of fact, when you ordered it, the standard axle was a 410 Dana. Didn't matter if it came with an automatic or a stick. In this case, we've got a stick here. Now, once you have this potent package right from the factory, if you were going to take it to a super tuner, who would you take it to? Well, of course, Mr. Norm. Every single Mopar enthusiast in North America is holding their breath right now. And we're hoping the best for this Mopar as well. We're gonna find out, but I think this car definitely has the best 60 foot times. This car comes out of the hole really hard, but it just doesn't seem to want to pull as hard on the top end as some of the other cars. But I'll tell you, maybe it's, it's a little bit like the Shelby, where they're coming out of the hole hard, but they're just heavier cars than the rest and just not enough motor to pull the big heavy extra weight down the rest of the quarter mile. All in all, though, I bet you 60 foot times this is gonna be the fastest. This car has been dialed in perfectly. Like I said, when it's zero to 60, the car just hooks up, it launches, it goes. The Ram Rear 4 motor's making all sorts of horsepower. Nice package, good running car. In contrasting the data we took on the zero to 60 and the 60 foot times with the actual quarter mile results, it was interesting because the Super B had by far the best launch. It had almost a two second 60 foot time but it didn't have the top end of, say, the Baldwin Camaro, which had just, uh, I think, 107, 106, 107 miles an hour at the end of the quarter mile because it just had big power that came on at the end of the drag strip. So the Super B turns out to be absolutely awesome out of the hole. It's the Pontiac GTO that comes up with the best ET and almost the best mile an hour. And the Yanko Nova, albeit not in the basement, is pretty darn close. So when you add up the points, it's the Pontiac GTO, the Camaro, and the Dodge Super B on top of the chart. And I'll be darned if Peter wasn't right about the Shelby. When we come back, we're going to absolutely shred a couple of thousand dollars worth of perfectly good tires. You know, we supplied all new Bass Buy tires for these wonderful cars here. 
And you know, th th this burnout thing is absolutely wonderful. And the smoke, you know what it smells like to me? It smells like money. Everywhere I go, somebody always mentions Peter and the big smoky burnout done in a car that costs more than a house. <laughs> Well, it's kind of become a dream car trademark, hasn't it? It has for you. A and think about it. As long as the tires are spinning hard, there's no load on the motor. As long as they're not hooked up, you can't hurt anything. So we always incorporate a burnout contest at the end of the muscle car shootout. You can do the arithmetic if you don't like it, but we do it because we write the rules. the super muscle car shootout returns, we'll add up all the points and declare a winner. We're back to wrap it all up and we have to start with the burnout competition. How do you score that? Good job, by awesome, the way. Awesome burnouts, <laughs> really? but I'm not gonna score it. I'm not gonna be the Russian judge. You can be the Russian judge. Great. Let's just give them all the same. We'll give them all zeros then. Yeah, sure. Fair enough. As usual in a muscle car shootout, there are some disappointments and there are some real surprises. A little disappointed in the Yanko Nova. It had the potential to win. I thought it would, but you know what? Fresh restoration, tons of wheel hop, two weeks of debugging it, it would have done better. Or we could have got a better driver. The Scrambler was a neat car, fast car, did pretty darn well, but just had too much competition, I think. Yeah. Shelby and the Super B tie at 14 points, which Shelby, is... Shelby, I thought, was going to do better, but it was just, it was not downright slow, but it still ran a 14 flat, but just tough competition. And yeah. who'd have thought it would be the one to stop the quickest? Then the Camaro, we expected big things from that. Yeah, and it performed great. It's just this car outperformed it. It performed it awesome. Well, Milt Shornak, who built the cars originally, said, watch out for this car, it's going to fool you, and it sure did. The Ram Reform makes tons of horsepower. It's a tweaked car, you know, Pontiac's Royal Bobcat deal, nice, nice deal. That makes them even more expensive. Write to us, tell us what you'd like to see us do in the next Dream Car Garage shootout. Maybe a North American, European tour, and you can drive the European cars and I'll drive the North American cars. Then it's a lock, the European cars will win. We'll see you next time in the next shootout.